It's me again, Jen Ackerson, and I'd just like to start off this week with a little reminder of how great you're doing. This class has been such a pleasure for me to teach. Allowing me a window into your lives and skills through the role plays assignments has been such an honor and sometimes so very silly. So please thank your role play partners for me too. They are doing such excellent jobs and should probably get some sort of award for their improv skills. And I am so happy that it seems like you're all learning and able to apply these skills. So today we're talking about recognizing, rolling with, and resolving resistance. And I tried some alliteration in there with all those R's, like feeling like a little pirate today, R. But previously, we reviewed the concept of ambivalence as it pertains to addiction counseling. A person will experience ambivalence when two or more choices are in conflict. An example of this is a person who has a conflicting view of what they should be doing and what others should be doing compared to what's actually happening. These conflicts evoke ambivalence around change, and there's a sense of knowing something needs to be different. Today, we'll follow up with that conversation by discussing resistance and how this looks different than ambivalence in addiction counseling. In addiction counseling, we will experience clients that are resistant to change. Despite the best of intentions, individuals with substance use disorders may have an unfavorable response to change. Remember that all change is loss. Even positive change brings about loss, especially for individuals who have substance use disorders. They experience a ton of loss around the addiction. They stand to lose maybe the only coping skill that they felt worked for them. Loss of people, sometimes best friends, places, things, all those trigger words. Change means losing connection to these things. And if you remember from the solutions focus section last week, these were all solutions that they found that in some way worked for them. And now they're on the cusp of losing all of these solutions, maybe without a clear picture of what to put in their places. So scary stuff. It might evoke fear, evoke anxiety. It will surely feel uncomfortable. However, we need to explore the long-term outcome of what we're doing all of this for and instill hope that change is possible. So when speaking of hope, here's a prompt for your first discussion question. What role does hope and spirituality have in addiction counseling? What, if any, resistance might you encounter around the topic of addiction and spirituality and recovery, and how would you address it? So moving on, resistance might also be a reactive process here. An example could be an individual who has an adverse consequence associated with their use, potentially a DUI, and they're court-ordered to treatment. They might be resistant to change and resistant to participate in the treatment process, but this is a reactive process. They're feeling the fear and anxiety, and this might manifest in terms of resistance. Clients who are able to face anxiety and discomfort will be able to move on with the treatment episode. And when we talk about resistance, we can conceptualize resistance in three different ways. Resistance can be shown in behavior, resistance might look emotional, and resistance might be projected in terms of cognitive. Therefore, we see resistance in thinking, emoting, and behavioral manifestations. There might be all three of these situations happening, or maybe just one. It'll help us to get a sense of the depth of resistance by exploring the conceptualization of resistance from this framework. And avoid creating resistance as counselors. We cannot assume that clients will always be opposed to change, and you know what happens when you assume. So just be mindful of how you think, feel, and behave. Consider your values, attitudes, and biases. If we believe that individuals are opposed to change, our style might be different in the room, and we could actually be impacting the therapeutic alliance and creating a rupture. I've seen many old school counselors come from this attitude, and it's created some challenging client relationships. The client may have objections to change and can discuss their thoughts with you. Don't dismiss them. We might see that as incongruent that they're saying they want to change it, but their behaviors are saying the opposite, we would want to explore that. And if we're using a solution-focused approach, we understand that individuals have skills, assets, and abilities, and that part of the problem is the solution. So we don't want to exacerbate resistance by dismissing their objections. The objections are important, and they tell us a lot about the individual's ambivalence, resistance, and the meaning behind making change for them. It's not always about the client, so explore your role in navigating ambivalence, resistance, and motivation to change. I've read numerous articles on the phenomenon that clients will rise to our expectations of them. If we expect them to buck against change and be resistant, they will be. If we expect them to be unmotivated, they will be. 
how we treat them is typically influenced by our own internal sphere more than how they're presenting. So pay close attention to what's going on inside of you when the ideas of ambivalence and resistance emerge. Self-care is vital to this process. We need to participate in self-care before we start to stand on the edges of compassion, fatigue, vicarious trauma, or burnout. Counselors have those pieces may in fact create resistance unknowingly or subconsciously. So the more that we take care of ourselves, the better off that we are, and therefore the better off we can help our individuals in the recovery process become their best selves. Confrontation is not a negative piece of the work that we do. Confrontation is just a process of directing someone's attention to something that he or she is potentially not looking at. And I really like that definition. It doesn't have to be as forceful and end in a fight like we might expect. It's just pointing out incongruences. Clients must feel that the counselor is aligned with them before they will engage in a dialogue about change. The therapeutic alliance and the rapport must exist as a foundation here. And when that does happen, individuals are more receptive to confrontation and being able to look at those incongruent pieces. Being able to use confrontation is another way that involves accepting the client at whatever stage of treatment they may be in. Whatever stage of change we assess them as being in or whatever they assess themselves as being in, we need to create a sense of safety in the room and be able to confront and do it effectively and ensure that ongoing safety exists. And I really think here that there's a nice overlap with your Gabor Mate text chapter this week. Mate talked about this concept of compassionate curiosity. And doesn't that sound so much more lovely than confrontation? Yet they can be one in the same. Compassionate curiosity is an attitude or approach characterized by a combination of empathy, understanding, and genuine interest in understanding somebody's thoughts, feelings, experiences, or perspectives. It involves approaching people and situations with an open and non judgmental mindset, seeking to learn and connect on a deeper level. So let's do that, right? Let's learn to do it with ourselves first and then apply it to the ways that we might confront clients with incongruences. And as I mentioned earlier, there are provoking situations as part of the change process. Change is loss. Anxiety becomes uncomfortable. Counselors will need to learn how to help manage anxiety in the counseling environment while staying calm, keeping a cool tone, and still allowing the therapeutic alliance to speak for itself while creating safety in the room. As such, counselors need to develop skills in their awareness, identification, and effective management of a client's anxiety within the context of the therapy. And there are two important factors to consider. First, to pursue the objectives of therapy, even though it can be uncomfortable, frightening, and even painful. And second, we do so in a way that the client can tolerate. So we see here what will continue to pursue the goals and objectives will recognize the fact that it will be uncomfortable. It can be frightening and even painful at times emotionally. People are going to begin to deal with things that they have probably not dealt with for a very long time. People are going to share with you their most vulnerable, sacred secrets that they've not shared with anyone else in their lives. So we need to recognize the importance of this, and we need to be able to have the skills in our toolbox before so that we can help individuals experience those uncomfortable emotions in a way that they can tolerate. And this may be through helping to open windows of tolerance. It may be learning to urge surf or sit with just comfort, learning self-regulation, self-rescue techniques, and relaxation and grounding techniques. There can be a lot of flavors and languages to the way that you manage anxiety in your space. Ultimately, we're trying to make uncomfortable moments more tolerable and tap into that resilience of getting through difficult times without picking up a mood-altering chemical. And potentially an unpopular opinion here, but one of my favorite group activities is designed around raising the level of anxiety within the group space in a team building puzzle solving experiential that addresses just this topic. And I'm sure that there's tons of activities out there aimed at this purpose, but my favorite one is called Traffic Jam. And message me if you're interested in it. I'll see if I can find it in my dusty and trusty pile of group activities. But the point is, can we get uncomfortable and still work together to solve a problem? And what a great lesson to learn in early recovery. And generally what happens is that 99% of the group will accomplish the task and the anxiety will immediately shift and change into relief and celebration. But there's always at least one person who cannot tolerate the experiential and will quit. They'll rejoin the group and stay in anxiety long after the group has moved on. And it's a powerful process for clients to observe. Usually hold a discussion around this. What happens if we give up? What happens if we leave in the middle? We tell ourselves it's self-protection, but what does it actually accomplish? A sour mood for the rest of the day. 
So there's a saying here, don't quit before the miracle happens. Another thing that we can do instead of pushing against a window of tolerance is we can agree with a twist. And I think it's a fun little way of putting it. As people are feeling uncomfortable and they're experiencing bouts of resistance, we're going to be doing a lot of reflection and reframing with them. We're very attentive to what they're saying and what they're not saying. And we're attentive to what's happening in the room. How does it feel? What's the tone of the session? What is the person experiencing in the here and now? So agreeing with a twist is accomplished when the counselor reflects back with the client saying with agreement but also adds a new frame of reference to it. So for example, a client statement might be, nobody can tell me how to raise my kids. You don't live in my house. You don't know how it is. And a counselor response who's using agreeing with a twist might say, well, the truth is that it is really up to you and how you, you raise your kids and what they learn. You are in the best position to know which ideas are likely to work and which ones aren't. And I can't just be prescribing things for you or demanding change from you. You need to be a full partner in this process. So other methods utilized to connect with clients involve this scared mnemonic, shifting focus, coming alongside or continuing to walk alongside the client, agreeing with a twist, reframing, emphasizing personal choice or control, and disclosing feeling. Remember that our therapeutic alliance is very critical during these resistance moments. We're going to stay connected yet. We're going to help lead and guide as much as we need to, to ensure that the individuals are getting the skills that they need to make positive personal choices in their recovery process. As we're creating connections with our clients, we're also allowing individuals the freedom to fail. In recovery, we understand that relapse is not required, but it can and will happen. We say progress, not perfection, right? So in addiction counseling, we're doing relapse prevention planning with individuals or looking to identify triggers for relapse and coping strategies around relapse. Individuals are not always going to know what their triggers are or what effective coping looks like. And we'll go through the process of change and regression. We'll go back through the process of making successful changes, then falling back, and some new coping skills will be needed. And that's okay. We have unconditional acceptance and we'll work with people that are struggling to make sustainable change. There's a lot to learn from how and when an individual does relapse and how we use that as a solution-focused approach to find exceptions to their ability to sustain recovery processes. It's a natural process in which clients move back and forth between a solution, ambivalence, and resistance. And this can change daily. It might change by mood. It might change moment to moment for individuals depending on where they are in their change process and where their ability to implement effective coping strategies lies. So their recovery environment plays a huge role here. And I really like this excerpt from your Mate chapter this week that says, no organism in nature is separate from the system in which it lives, functions, and dies. And no natural process can be understood in isolation from its physical and biological context. From an ecological perspective, the addiction process doesn't happen accidentally, nor is it pre-programmed by heredity. It is a product of development in certain contexts, and it continues to be manifested by factors in the environment. So if we take those words but replace addiction with recovery, it's also true. So let me read it again. No organism in nature is separate from the system in which it lives, functions, and dies, and no natural process can be understood in isolation from its physical and biological context. From an ecological perspective, the recovery process doesn't happen accidentally, nor is it pre-programmed by heredity. It is a product of development in a certain context, and it continues to be maintained by factors in the environment. So here's another discussion prompt for today. Consider your viewpoint of the ecology of healing. Explain this concept and how it may or may not connect with hope and spirituality in addictions counseling. So you can see there's a ton of factors that influence change, recovery, and relapse. What is important for you to understand is that every person has a unique experience. They can and will move back and forth between solution, ambivalence, and resistance. And each time we'll learn more about what makes recovery successful for that particular individual. Thus, rolling with resistance frustrates strategy by avoiding the trap of taking a side. 
We allow a client to keep vacillating between solution, ambivalence, and resistance. We continue to explore the skills, assets, and the solution. Clients will eventually be sick and tired of being sick and tired and will know now that they are ready to act. And when they are ready to act, we can continue to use the strengths, abilities, and what we know about the clients help motivate them in a positive direction that is unique to their experience. Rolling with resistance means acknowledging and respecting the client's perspective, even if it contradicts the counselor's goals. It can be the attitude of taking what you need and leaving the rest. Instead of trying to confront or overpower the client's resistance, the counselor tries to collaborate with the client to find common ground and build trust by (laughs) empathizing with the client's concerns and exploring their underlying motivations. The counselor can help the client discover their own reasons for changing and develop a sense of ownership over the therapeutic process. Rolling with resistance is not a passive approach, but rather an active effort to engage the client and empower them to make positive changes in their lives. So let's keep looking at motivational interviewing techniques and how they apply to the session. How do we evoke change? How do we see exceptions to the problem? What types of solutions and coping strategies can we find? Even in a relapse situation, the counselor's role is to identify the discrepancies clearly, be explicit about the inconsistencies that we see, and continue to engage in motivational interviewing skills and help to engage in a cognitive mapping process that will evoke change. Making explicit the rock and the hard place. Clients will express their resistance to change in order to justify the status quo. When it becomes too difficult, when the process just seems too large, individuals will express resistance just to justify not changing. This idea of I'm better off if I just stay the way I am. I've tried to make change and nobody cared. Or, you know, my example from last week about wanting to eat healthier, but then getting a burger instead. You know, I ate a salad every day for a week straight and haven't lost any weight. What's the point? In these moments, they're just justifying the status quo. We would then start to look at the situation. What did you believe was going to happen when you changed this behavior? What was the outcome of the situation and why did it not match what you thought would happen? Let's look at any ego defense mechanisms or cognitive distortions that occurred and find ways to offer effective new thinking and behavioral modification. The nonlinear thinking counselor. This is the counselor who listens with the third ear. The counselor's first approach is to roll with resistance. The next more active step is to develop discrepancies. So we're going to continue to learn about the unique experience. We're going to explore our toolbox, continue to put these things in our memory bank and help to make an overall hypothesis about what's happening and share with the client as appropriate and confront as needed. Developing discrepancies. When we talk about motivational interviewing in relation to developing discrepancies, there are a couple common exercises. They include value clarification and weighing the costs of the behavior. Every individual has values. For individuals who are in early recovery process and experiencing ambivalence or resistance to change, their values are in conflict and are often in flux. They might have core values, but at this time, can they get there? Do they recognize them? Are their behaviors congruent with their values? Is thinking congruent with their values or incongruent? So let's do some value exploration and help identify some of our core values of what we can talk about. One of the common discrepancies you might see in a workaholic like me is identifying that their family is the top value. They're going to say, hey, my number one value is my family, yet they spend 10 plus hours a day out of the home. They miss family dinner on a daily basis. They're exhausted from working. They don't have the energy to help the kiddos with homework or participate in bath time or bedtime. And the justification is that by working, they're bringing home money to support the family that they love and value so much. And I might point out here that it seems like they value work and money and success more than they value family. No right or wrong values here. No right or wrong hierarchy just an observation based on behaviors. There's a discrepancy in what they're saying and what they're doing. We might look at cost benefits analysis here or a decisional balance model. Does the behavior match with your values or does it not match? What are you getting from it? What are you losing from it? Let's talk about what the cost may be and what might be causing this to happen and what we can do about it. Developing discrepancies serves the purpose of providing motivation for our clients to make a decision by building awareness, by making certain that the client's resistance remains the focus. This is done by extrapolating the consequences of the client's action or lack of action. So here again, we're bringing to light in the counseling session. We're being transparent. We're sharing with the individual. Although you shared with me, this is your value. I'm wondering if you felt as though you were living true to your value and 
when you engaged in that behavior. Or to me, it seems like the behavior you engaged in did not fully match what you were telling me that you valued the most right now. So discrepancies in values as it pertains to rolling with resistance allows the client to be in a less threatening position. This is the idea of making a choice, recognizing this or that, how they're interrelated or not. Sometimes simply bringing a discrepancy to light is enough to motivate a client to begin embracing the desire to change. Individuals are going through a very challenging time and recovery process as they have experienced a wealth of loss, and they're in the process of exploring who they are as a recovering individual. Sometimes just understanding is enough to help motivate them along the path to recovery. Change talk is enhanced when a client perceives his or her behavior to be incongruent with important personal goals and values. And last week, we talked about change talk and sustained talk. There's that darn cat again, desire for change, ability for change, reasons for change, and need for change, and then commitment, activation, and taking steps. So here's a little refresher slide since eliciting change is not just for ambivalence, it's also used in resistance too. So do not underestimate the power of kindness and its connection to the healing process. The therapeutic alliance is significant. Being able to be genuine, express empathy, confront, and using that compassionate curiosity are all very important pieces to the work that addictions counselors do on a daily basis. So let's continue to uncover who we are as professionals and demonstrate integrity, empathy, and genuineness throughout the healing process.